and be like, I'm crazy. <laughs> <laughs> the morning first, I was like, I don't recognize that participant. It must be your dad. And I was like, mm -hmm. uh, hmm, someone new's joining us. How are you this morning? Good. Awesome. So where are you at in, in the in the stem cell stuff? What did you work on yesterday? Oh, uh, uh, yesterday, uh, we worked on the, the sonar. Awesome. So did you get it to work? Um, uh, no, not really. Okay. Uh, it wouldn't move. Well, we're going to, I think we're going to talk a little bit about that today. And if you need help, just stay on afterwards and we'll make sure we get you what you need. Okay. And my sister's running a little late. That's quite all right. She's got a little one to take care of. But look at you, you're on here without her. That's awesome. So are you get you getting excited about sixth grade this year? Yes, definitely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you ready to go back to actual school? Mm, kind of. Kind of. Yeah. Yeah. I'm ready to see my friends, but I'm not ready to do the walk. <laughs> yeah, I get that. I get that. It'll be a big change. You'll be going over to the high school and things are totally different over there although I, I think they still kind of keep you guys all in one little building there it's not like you got to go all over the big campus um, except for things like you know going out for pe and stuff yeah. like that ag if you do agriculture if you have a class in agriculture and some of the the other classes like that your electives but um Yeah, you'll have that. You'll be able to tell some of the classmates. You can say, "Hey, I worked with Miss Sapp this summer. You guys were such a great group in fourth grade." Thank you. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Oh, now I have crazy. Oh, we got a couple of minutes. You look like you got that jungle vibe. Oh, there it's gone. Yeah. You look like you had a jungle vibe going on there. Yeah, we have been trying to figure out, um, Andrea obviously has mastered that, how to get a still photo instead of the video of us all day long. I, you guys get to see me eating my breakfast and my lunch when I get done. And, um, So we'll get started here in a minute. We've been starting about 9.05 just to make sure everybody has opportunity to log in. I think if you go under your account, you can log in a photo, like upload a photo to it. Oh, hang on. Let me put this on. Who was saying something? I said, I think if you go to your account, you can upload a photo into it. I did on my profile and I thought maybe when you because for what I understood if I stop video it should override it should pick up that photo but it's it didn't do it this morning so I'm not real sure why. Mm. Um. Good morning. Good morning Terry, Linda, Brian. Good morning Nancy, Andrea. Can you all hear me? I see one yes. Okay, good. So I want to get started uh, without the, the in-person video because I set the camera up like this. And you all have a rover. And you, at least most of you, are there that you can that you can have the rover turn the head left right 
left, right. You see, I'm using the remote control. And of course, the rover can move too. So let me get started. It wasn't easy to get to this point. There were quite a few things. Number one, the rover needed to be assembled, but it also needed to be wired right. Um, and then it needed quite a little bit of code to get it there. So what was the hardest thing to get wherever you are with the rover? What was the hardest thing to get there? Would like somebody speak up and say, it took me hours and hours and hours to get over, get over what? It took us a few hours yesterday when we were doing the steering calibration. The steering calibration? Yes, when we, we, when we got to the fine part of it, we couldn't, it wasn't doing like, every now and then they would go straight instead of turning. And so we re had to redo the whole entire code. Oh, did you, did you figure out that the front wheel, the position of the front wheel, when you set it down, did you figure out that makes a huge difference? Yes. Yes. We, had to, we made sure every time we put it in the same exact spot, absolutely straight. Absolutely straight. And it still did, did go sometimes left and sometimes right? No. We, after, the, after we set it straight, like if there was a little piece of dirt on the ground, it would make it, it, make it change as well. Yes. Yeah. We don't have quite a, you know, maybe you have a truck with four wheel drive and you can almost drive anywhere. Well, that Rover is not designed to take anything. So it doesn't go exactly the same way. However, <clears throat> at least with, with fairly fresh batteries, one, one of the concerns is when the batteries get weak, and you all notice those DC motors, if you do like speed 20 and speed 30, the rover doesn't move at all. That is just too little. Those numbers simply mean a voltage for the DC motors. And if the voltage is too small, then there is just a current through the wire, which doesn't, which is not strong enough to turn the wheel. Um, if you come to my physics class, you can uh, see how motors work. It's a magnetic interaction between permanent magnets and, and coils. And if that force is too weak and there is enough friction and we have geared motors, which have some friction, then the motors don't turn. It needs a minimum of a voltage. And when the batteries get weak, you will notice that the rover will move more erratic uh, just because the two different wheels, they turn in a different way. So, but you overcome, the, could you do the steering? Yes. 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 And did you make a graph? Um, not yet. We were going to redo it today. Okay. Just because we got so frustrated yesterday with it that we, we did it and she had to leave. So we're going to redo the steering count the steering part today and make the graph okay for most students making a table with numbers is a nice thing but the numbers kind of if it's if it's too many numbers then it doesn't make sense putting it in, in a graph helps to really understand what those numbers mean and that's actually why we make graphs you know if we look in the newspaper and look for the stock market development of over the past two weeks and those uh, that line goes up and down we can see immediately if there is a good week then those that line is just 
rising and rising and rising, oh, that means the stock market is doing great. Everybody sees it in a graph with one glance and very often, well, you have to be an accountant or something like this to see that the numbers actually mean the same thing, but it's more, it's more difficult to see. Are there any other comments about what was hard? For me, the um, the steering with the head, I'm not on like the control with it, but making the head move, the degrees were way off and it wasn't right. It wasn't right. Did you check the blocks were the steering? I think he's talking about, are you talking about it being straight on if the servo head is way off when he checks it? So he had to, remember you have to change that number. So he may need to just reset his servo. Oh, so right. Can, that's what he's on. Can, can, can you show me your rover when you turn it on? Yeah, hold up. So while we're getting that, what we were finding was um, the degrees did not relate at all to the movement we were actually seeing on the servo motor. For example, one time we were trying to just reset it to zero and yeah. the motor actually spun 360 degrees two or three times. We had to shut it off to make it stop. Okay, here is what happens. Uh, here, watch. The, okay, show it, yeah. Turn it on. Sit. Yep. What? And I don't remember what degrees that set do, but yeah. every time we would change it, we would change it by one degree and it would like be way off. Okay. Here's the story. The servo motor needs a number at the pin. You, you know, that there's the statement which says, servo right pin, which pin is it? P15? 15. Yeah. P15, and then there is a number. That number must be a number between zero and 180. Actually, it is better to be a number between, let's say, more than zero, 20, to less than 180, let's say 160 is less than, than 180. Most servo motors, this type of servo motors, if they get a number which is larger and they can't take, they start spinning. Is that what you saw? That the head was spinning? Yeah, but it took, it was with zero and also with like, um, yeah. I think it was a different one, but I can't remember. This, this is why we start, if you look at your on start block, the first time we make a servo right pin P15, we actually write it to 90 because 90 is halfway between zero and 180. But so when 90 should, should be straight. But when we tried it on 90, it wasn't straight. It wasn't straight, okay. And that means- And we tried to mess with the degrees on the on start and it nope. just never would work. Yeah, no, nope. that's the wrong thing to do. The right thing to do, if you put 90 to the servo motor, and, okay, here's mine. If you put 90 to the servo motor, and it looks like this, way off. Yeah. What you need to do is undo that little screw, that tiny little black screw down here, mm -hmm. and pull the head off straight up, and set it straight. Oh. You see, underneath there is that gear from the, from the servo motor, that, that white gear. And of course, that gear has teeth. And if you offset that gear, then the servo motor may be in the right position, but the head in the wrong position. Oh. So fixing the initial position of the, of the, sonar mount on the servo motor, that's the right thing to do. And then yours also will work all right. 
Okay, thank you. Right. Here. I don't have a screwdriver on me, so I'm gonna have to find one. So, so however, that was a great example to get started. What just happened, did you see, we were looking first for a problem in the software. We tried to fix the problem. The problem couldn't be fixed because the problem was actually, at least I believe that we find that out in a minute, um, the problem was actually in the hardware, meaning in the physical arrangement of the servo motor and the head. Mm -hmm. Because from now on, I would like you to see that, yes, you have only one rover and it's one device. But actually, every time you change the software on the micro bit, your rover becomes another rover. It changes its identity because it can do, you can, well, you can do, make many mistakes in the software and it may happen that the rover isn't doing anything or you can make it turn the head left, right, left, right a hundred times and maybe only driving backwards or maybe only spinning. You can do that just by changing the software. You don't have to change the rover, the, the rover mechanics at all. So only the combination between the parts you put together and the software makes a functional device. And every time you change the software, it will be a new rover. Okay. All right, let's talk a little bit more about how far we are. And turn it back on. And I said it about here. Oh, hang on. So the next thing, and some of you have probably done that, is when we have the rover in a way that the head turns in a way, then no, it doesn't work. Um, then whatever is in front of the eyes, it's not really eyes, it's the sonar which sends out that pulse and listens for what comes back, measures the time, and the time is reported on one of the wires going back to the micro bit, and, well, the micro bit converts the time, which is a complex signal, it converts it into a number. And maybe you have done it already, or you will get there shortly. Actually, what the micro bit gets from the sonar, every time it passes through the forever loop, it gets a number for a variable which we call distance. So every time we go through the loop, our LEDs in the back blink, because the micro bit takes that number and converts the distance in a number which chooses the row of the LED. So right now, the front LEDs, three front LEDs are blinking because there is no obstacle in front of the rover. If I put this there, now the next to the last row of the LEDs is blinking because it says there is an obstacle at a distance. Oh, you can't see the obstacle. Let me turn this a little bit. Here is the obstacle. Um, the obstacle is at a distance of, this is about 20 centimeters. If I move the obstacle a little more close, the last row of the LEDs come on our software chooses which row of LEDs to make blink according to that number which we call distance. So if I move it further away and I move it further out, I can make each one, and this is what we call the sonar test. This is how you can test that your sonar is working correctly. There are a couple of issues with the sonar. Sometimes, 
all five LEDs, and I will show the code in a minute, all five LEDs in the rear come on. And the code is made in a way that that only happens when distance, that variable, is zero. And you see, well, the distance is hardly ever zero. That is a thing which has something to do with the board on the sonar. Simply think about this, you are out there at night and you listen to the sounds and you hear the cars on the, on the road driving by and you hear maybe some bird uh, walking along the branches in a tree and then you suddenly hear a sound which doesn't make sense. And immediately you may, you may think, oh, this is a coyote or maybe this is a bear and you become afraid but then after a while, your eyes get used to the darkness and you see, oh, that's just a raccoon uh, digging in the, in the leaves. So what happened? Your ears, your acoustic sensors, they hear noises and your brain makes sense out of them. This is how you identify, oh, this is a car driving by or this is something else happening. But then it may be possible that your sensor, the ear, tells you a noise where your brain says, I don't know what this is. And then what do you do? Well, you may get afraid or you may walk closer and look what it is. So you do something about it. And this board on this board, which carries the sonar, what it does, if it doesn't recognize what's coming back, it sends a zero back. Normally, it measures distance and it sends 20 centimeters, it sends 25, it sends numbers back, but it doesn't, if, when it happened that it doesn't know what to do, it sends a zero back and that makes it appear that the board is malfunctioning. So we will see that later when we make our navigation test. This is a problem, but this is a problem which is similar to being out at night and not recognizing some of the noises. We need to accept that problem. So who of you did already the sonar test as I did right now, measuring the distance by looking at the LEDs? Who is there? I haven't yet. You we were stuck on the head last night. Uh -huh. This is where we left off. We we did the code and got it going just because we were frustrated at the steering part. At the, okay. But we're going to do the sonar test here shortly. Okay, but but it seems straightforward how to do that now. Yes, and, and, the, and the, the, the sonar, the lights are blinking correctly how you have said. Okay. Any other hard things you encountered? Uh, I'm reading the chat for you. I'll just tell you. Oh, yeah, I don't see the chat. Nancy says that the hearing was challenging, but she said that what you said was quite helpful and it's an amazing amount of uh, technology and small bandwidth. And it's in the branch that they're going to be working on that today. So. Okay. So that's very good. That This is why we do that. Normally, well, Normally, we don't spend that much time with a couple of electronic parts. So the rover, how we have designed the, the modules, how we go through, is a very short walk in a couple of days through quite a bit of technology, yes. And it is a short walk where you get exposed in a very quick way and a very basic way to all those basic functions. Remember when I talked last week about the uh, robots? Robots can be very complex, but we have the basic functions of motion with the wheels. We have the ba basic function of sensors with the sonar. And we have the basic function of a brain with the micro bit and combined together, they have to function together and that's what makes the software that what's, this is why we need the software 
to make those devices work together. Um, I want to dig a little deeper into the navigation part and take over with my computer. Okay, okay, I should. I should be back. Does this work better? Yes. <clears throat> okay. So let's see. Here I am, but actually I want to share the screen and I want to go there. I don't want to go there right now. Okay. So let me go back to the sonar function. So the rover knows the distance in centimeters. Like at 25 centimeters, the rover gets the number 25, but we know there is an obstacle. When the rover gets a number 15, the rover just has a different number. The rover doesn't care. But we know that the obstacle is pretty close. If the distance is five centimeters, the rover just measure, measures that number five. But we know that the obstacle is very close. Now, if we move the obstacle further away at 30 centimeters, we know the obstacle is further away. And if it's really, really far, then we know the obstacle is far away. You see in my two columns, the rover, the micro bit, only knows numbers. We know what the numbers mean. So what we really want is if the rover gets the number 25, then we would like the rover turn slightly to the right or to the left. If the number is a smaller number, the rover, we want the rover to turn harder because the obstacle is closer. If the obstacle is very close, turning doesn't help anymore. We want the rover to stop and to back off. And if the obstacle is far enough away, the rover actually don't has, has anything to do but watch again to measure the distance again, see what happens. And if it's really far away, no action is needed whatsoever. So <clears throat> how do we achieve that? Well, we do have the micro bit. So at a distance of 25 centimeters, when the rover should turn slightly, then we keep the speed number, which can come from our remote control or is that number we set in the on start block. But then we set steer to a small number to make it turn slightly. And the micro bit controls when the distance gets smaller, then we have to increase that steer number to make the rover turn harder to the left or to the right. When the distance is too small, when the obstacle is too close, then steering doesn't help 
we simply set the speed to zero and then we set the speed to negative 50 to make the rover stop and back off. Now, if the obstacle is far enough away, we don't care. We keep the speed and keep steer and do whatever we want the rover to do because if there is no obstacle, we don't need to avoid it. So you see, there are only three things to do. The micro bit or the rover should turn if there is an obstacle in a distance which may be a concern. The second possibility is when the obstacle is too close, stop and back off. If the distance is a number larger than that range, when we have a concern, then there is no action needed. These are the three things we need to kind of teach the micro bit to do that the rover will do that. And how do we do that? Here you see two if, if blocks, one inside the other, and that's part of our forever loop. It starts with, if the distance is less than, and we started with a number which we called OA2 of 30, meaning we know this is 30 centimeters. If the distance is less than 30 centimeters, then there is an obstacle and we need to do something. Inside, if the distance is less than 30, the distance could be 25 or it could be 2. 25 is close and 2 is too close. So we make another if statement and check again what is that number. If the distance is less than 5, then we need to stop and back up. The inside else statement, the if distance is less than five, then the rover should step, stop and back up, has an else part, which simply means if the distance is not less than five. Not less than five means 15. 15 is still less than 30. You see the outside loop, distance is less than 30, but it is larger than five, then under that condition, we want the micro bit to make the decision, now you have to turn. The last else in that statement is the else belonging to the distance, to the if distance less than 30, else meaning the distance is not less than 30, it's more than 30, like 45 or 75, then we simply want the rover to keep going. So here are the statements. You all have done it by now. Drive wheels with speed negative 50 and steer, uh, the steer variable, um, makes the rover back up and we wait 500 milliseconds, half a second, we drive half a second backwards and then stop the rover with drive wheels with speed zero. For the keep going, well, we don't actually need a statement for the keep going, we just keep the speed and let the wheels turn. And the most difficult part is the middle part. If there is an obstacle, and the rover should turn, then we need to figure out, well, how much does it need to turn? Here you see a graph where the horizontal axis is that distance variable. The distance variable is a positive number between, or well, positive or zero number, between zero and the maximum what our sonar can do, and it goes 
certainly to 40, 60, 70, 80, it can go under, under ideal circumstances about to 300 or 400. But we're not concerned about the hundreds, we are concerned about when the obstacle is close and here you see that range between five centimeters and 30 centimeters. Now, do I have a cursor? Okay, here's five centimeters and here is 30 centimeters. This is the range where the rover has to turn, but it has to turn just slightly at 25 centimeters and it has to turn harder if the distance is smaller. So the, the vertical variable, let's call the steer variable, needs to be larger when the distance is smaller. You see this is a line with a negative slope because it goes down. It needs to be larger. We need to steer harder at small distances and we need to steer just a little bit at larger distances to get out of the way of the obstacle. Of course, we can do this in numbers. We can make a table like this. If the distance is zero, one, two, three, four, well, remember this is way too close. Then we set the steer to zero and we actually back off. If the distance is five, that's very close, then 50 makes the rover just spin in front of the obstacle, get out of the way. But then when the numbers get larger and larger and larger, you see the numbers become smaller. These are actually those points in the graph. You see, we cannot tell the micro bit, oh, you're closer, you need to steer harder we need to give the micro bit, the micro bit actually needs to figure out to come up with those numbers on its own because we don't know what the distance variable is in every turn of the forever loop. So we make it calculate, here are the two examples, we make it calculate a steer of 10 for here, a steer of 10, for a distance of 25 and a steer of 30 for 15. And we don't have, you can easily imagine for each of the numbers, we could actually write code to have, tell the micro bit what to come up with a number. That would be a very, very long program. You don't want to do that. This can be done by code. And here is the code. Here are those five statements. And with those five statements, we compute something which is called OA strength. It seems, simply means obstacle avoidance strength. And the obstacle avoidance strength, you see the graph here, has to be very strong, 100% for zero to five, and then it drops slowly all the way down to zero at 30 centimeters. Here is our sloping interaction, our sloping determination for the micro bit and for the rover, what to do at which distance. So here we go. The slope of that line is simply computed from that first statement, the difference between the OA2 and the OA from. Remember the OA2 is the 30, the OA from is the five. So in here is actually take 30, subtract five. What do you get? 25. Okay. So that's the difference between the horizontal difference. The slope is computed as negative 100. The slope is downward, so it needs, it needs to be a negative number. This is where the minus sign comes from. And 100 is actually the maximum range of the strength variable, zero to 100%. So it's negative 100 divided by the 25 we had. What is 100 divided by 25? It's four. 
So there is a negative four. The slope of this line is a negative four. And then we need to take into account that the slope starts actually at five. So we need to correct this. It's 100 minus the slope times the OA from, and I should have arrows here. Let me see. Okay. So this is the computation of the slope. This is the computation of, you see, that line is heading for the 120. And this is where the line actually begins. And then the strength is computed as each point going down the slope. This equation computes for each number distance, that's the number which comes from the sonar, it computes a new number which is OA strength, and once we know the direction, that's the last statement, the last statement, we need to somehow figure out do we want to turn left or did, did we want, do we want to turn right? So at this point, our, the micro bit <coughs> has computed, that must be part of the forever loop. For each distance, the micro bit will compute a appropriate strength to make a decision how hard to turn. Here is another part of the code we do. We don't know to turn left or right. Now, ideally, uh, let me switch back to, oops, where is my Zoom meeting? Back to the rover here. If we have the rover here, and there is an obstacle like this, we would like, you see the LEDs? Okay, here we go. We would like, if the obstacle is inclined like this, we would like the rover to turn left. If I do it the other way around, we would like to turn the rover to turn right. However, remember it's a sonar. The sonar sends the sound somewhere there and receives the echo. And did you see what happens when I turn the obstacle? Here is the obstacle straight in front of the rover, and we see the rover says it's fairly close. And now if I turn at the same distance the obstacle, do you see what happens? The rover thinks, yes, there is an obstacle, but the rover actually thinks the sonar measures a larger distance. How come? It's the same distance. What happens is the sonar always does the same thing. It sends out that sound, which is reflected. Do you see what happens? It acts like a mirror. The sound is reflected in this direction. So there is less coming back to the sonar, which makes the sonar device think the distance is further away. So we actually don't have a good way to make a decision for the rover to turn left and right. Now, I have a special rover. Do you all see this? You don't have that rover. The rover has two sonars and is actually capable of measuring is the obstacle closer at the left and closer to the right? 
this is how this rover could make the decision. However, we don't have two, two sonar, so we have to do something else. And give me a second. Unmute. I should be back. And I also need a video. And here we go. So instead, we have to make a decision. The micro bit has to turn the wheels something to do. And what we do is we pick a random number. If I don't know to go left or right, I cannot simply not do anything because there is an obstacle. I need to pick a number, and this is what the micro bit can do. The statement for determining that direction, which way to turn, is pick a random number of zero or one. So after this statement, the direction is zero or one. However, zero doesn't help us much to do. What we do is, if OA direction comes out as zero, we send it, we set it to a negative one. So after this block of statements, OA direction is either negative one or positive one. And we simply turn left with a negative number and turn left with a right, uh, with a positive number. And this is what we did in the calculation here. Our strength, how, how hard to turn is computed from that slope, which takes the distance into account, and that random choice of plus minus one going left or right. So after throwing the dice, the micro bit throws the dice, it produces a one or negative one, and that makes the rover turn right or left every time it encounters an obstacle. So here is the summary so far. We figured out, and that's our navigation task number one, there are only three things to do. The rover should turn if there is an obstacle. If the obstacle is too close, it should stop. Or if the obstacle is far enough away, don't care, do nothing. We chose that that strength changes from a distance from five to 30 centimeters. And at this point in time, when you get to navigation one, those will be constants, which means the five is a fixed number and the 30 is a fixed number. And OA strength, that variable, which determines how hard to turn, and the OA direction, they determine how hard the rover steers to the left or right. However, there is something which is important to consider. If the obstacle is at 25 centimeter and the rover is very, very slowly moving, the rover has actually plenty of time to make a turn. But if the rover is fast, then it covers more distance in the same time, so it has to turn harder. And if the distance is 15 centimeter, a slow rover should turn hard, then a fast rover must turn harder. It needs to react quicker when it is moving faster. Now, of course, if the obstacle is too close, then the two have to do, to do the same. And if the obstacle is further away, when a slow rover simply said, well, I'm not worried about that yet, then a fast rover should turn slightly 
to be able to get out of the way. And of course, for very far, it will be the same, the same thing. So we kind of understand our obstacle avoidance strength tells the microbit how hard to do things, but speed plays another role in this. So we will go to another level where actually that range of five to 30 centimeters is not a fixed range of distances. We make those variables and if those are variables, we can also compute them every time. And we will change our, the first start block has that fixed five to 30 centimeters. We change those in the forever loop to be dependent on the speed. So let's say if the speed is 100 times 0.1, 100 times 0.1 is 10. So the OA from is actually larger at a speed of 100. And the OA2 is 100 times 0.2 is 20. Um, that is larger at a higher speed. And if speed is small, let's say 50, so the OA from 50 times 0.1, that's five times 0.2 is 25. So those numbers here, which we call later obstacle avoidance parameters, those are numbers 0.1, 0.2, and we will be using 0.3 and 0.4 and actually I recommend, maybe not today, but tomorrow, or the day after tomorrow, try those parameters out. They make your rover more intelligent, more intelligent to avoid obstacles. And here I am. Computers can be considered intelligent because they can remember so much stuff. But actually, what is intelligence? If a computer remembers a lot, which means if it has a memory which is full of information, it actually is not very useful if it only knows that, in, that information and doesn't do anything. And we answer ourselves that question, what do we really mean with intelligence? Isn't intelligence something where somebody makes the right decision in a difficult situation. Wouldn't we think that even an animal, your cat or your dog, if going outside and saying, oh, the weather is awful, it rains and it is muggy and humid outside, turns around and says, no, I want to be inside, isn't that an intelligent decision? So we can ask ourselves also, who is intelligent? Like dolphins are considered very intelligent, dolphins or whales are considered intelligent animals because those biologists who have examined the behavior of those elements, they actually do amazing things. And we humans consider us ourselves to be intelligent because we go to school and we learn to read and write and we learn math and it takes quite a bit to follow those math calculations and then computers and robots are well they are only machines so if they are intelligent they are actually not really intelligent, they only are intelligent, as intelligent as you are when you write the code for the microbit. So this is why it's called artificial intelligence. It is 
an artificially made machine, the, make, the machine always does whatever the machine is made for, but if we put that intelligence in the code that the machine can make wise decisions, then we consider that an intelligent machine. So you see, the machine is not really intelligent. It is you who writes the code who makes the machine intelligent. So are you all ready to make the navigation part for your over? Any questions? I can see you nodding or nobody says anything. Did I make it too complicated? No? It's quite a lot. It's quite a lot. Okay. At least at least you admit that it's quite a lot. But isn't it's kind it, of complicated? It's uh, but, but isn't isn't it interesting to say, well, I think I think you can do it. You can get that code into the microbit. It may cost a little bit of effort, but you can make it move. And we will see maybe tomorrow, maybe the day after tomorrow, that it actually can avoid obstacles. Do you think you can get there? Eventually. Eventually, that, that's a plan. As long as I didn't have to think up the code, I'm good. Okay, you have to think a little bit about. I'm sorry, you have to. No, think I'm saying that, that's the hard part because my mind does not okay. think that way. It, it, like with many things in life, there are hard things and not so hard things, and sometimes we just have to go through a short period of hard things. Hang on with me. Do you okay. want to? Yes, I do have a few things to cover, of course. You know me, I always have to clean up the end. Um, I don't have a whole bunch. Um, I think all the paperwork's in and all of that. I sent out a survey yesterday about the competition and I apologize because I got some great feedback back, but I did not ask for your name at the beginning of it. So I have no idea who signed up for what time, which was part of that to kind of arrange. So I'm going to either send out another one or I'm probably just going to call all of you and ask you that question um, about when, and this is for teachers. Um, teachers, you'll have to get with your students um, or children. Obviously, you're going to tell them what you want to do, but um, the teachers who are teaching other students, um, just get with them, find out about when the best time for the competition is. We are looking at trying to do it. Most people live in and around Madison. If you absolutely do not think you can arrange that, um, let us know. We will try to work however we can. We want everybody to compete. The other question I ask, and some of you are like, absolutely no, maybe, is if teachers wanted while you're here, after your student does the competition, if you wanted to use your rover in the competition and test your STEM skills, you certainly can. So um, we'll see how that goes. Right now, I have a couple who say, yeah, I want to test out my rover. We would love for you to do that just so that you understand what the student has to go through. Um, really gets, because you guys as the teachers, remember, you're helping us evaluate this as a student. And unless you do what we're asking the students to truly do, um, how can you evaluate that for us? So, um, if you want to, that is an option as well. So as far as competition, I do have, I'm going to share my screen and um, kind of show you the events we have posted. I'm going to post some more today and kind of talk to you just a minute about the competition events and how they're lined up. So as you're working through and you get done in the afternoon and your teacher was wiped out and they don't want to do any more, but you still want to play with your rover, this is what you can be working on, is how can I get my rover to be the best for the competition? So each one of our competition events um, corresponds with an activity that you have been doing in the Google Class, or not in the Google Classroom, but in the activities 
um, in, in your binder. So, up. Oh, sorry, I'm going to share my screen. Give me just a second to get in the student view. I don't want to show you my teacher view because we're still working on it. So I'm going to show you what the competitions I've actually added them for you guys. The first two, the first one I told you about the other day, which is the creativity expo. So if you go into the Google classroom now and you go down to module six, this is where we will post the directions for the competition. So I'll have more posted. So the first one was Creativity Expo. It just has to kind of do with that um, module two, introducing yourself. So we want you to add creative elements that maybe has something to do with your personality. Um, if you want the Creativity Expo, if you do not want to add, um, and I'm probably, not sharing my screen. Hold on a second. I'm just sharing my blue screen to you guys. No, you're sharing it. Was I sharing the right? You could see module six? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Sorry, let me go back then. Okay. So, um, thank you. Um, so, Creativity Expo, or Expo, the directions are right here for you. Um, what we're asking you to do on that one is create a Flipgrid video if you decide to decorate your rover up. And to, and the links on the directions, click it. It will take you to the right grid. Create a video just explaining your rover. What we're gonna ask is that you put it on the floor and let it move because part of the judging is what you added doesn't hinder um, the functionality of your rover. If you put a nice little design on it, but it keeps it from going fast, you're not gonna be able to win the next event. So you have to be very careful with how you add to it. Again, this is an optional event. You do not have to add anything to your rover. If you like the way it looks, leave it alone, okay? The second event I just added, it's called a race to the limit um, event. And it says, do you have the fastest rover? The skills that you learned in the propulsion test is what you will code into your rover. So when you get here on the day of the competition, we will have a device set up. You need to bring your USB that you have all your programs perfected on and you will stick it into our device. You'll hook your micro bit to it and you will upload the propulsion program. And for this event, you will set your car on a three point track. Now, and now we showed you what this looks like and you can do this when you're running your test. You would set your car on a three point track like this. Um, here, the front wheel is on the front mark, the back two are on the back ones. And you will press button A to change the speed. You will press button or button B to change the speed. You'll press button A to make it go. And you will see how far your rover can travel in two seconds. So you have to make sure that your code is set for the two second trial, okay? So when you're practicing, um, how far can your rover go, okay? And you may wanna test this out. You get to do three runs and you have to take an average. So this is where the math comes in. You have to average out your three runs and then you have to compute the speed. Speed equals distance traveled over time. And then you have to convert that measurement from centimeters to meters, which is what we do in science all the time. Okay, here comes the math and science. And you will give your score. Now, you can practice this at home. You have this paper. But when you get here, we will add your, we'll put your trials on there and then we'll send you over with your mentor if you need their help to compute all this. And then that will be your score. We will keep up with that and everybody's score as the two days go through. So you can see where you are in the races. Um, so that's the first two we have posted. I will have one or two posted again by this afternoon. The next one has to do with controlling your rover. So it has to do with how well can you use that remote control with your rover. It's all about the remote control. None of that um, navigation and avoiding obstacles that Dr. Marsh was talking about today. It's how good you are with the remote control and your rover. So you would upload your controlling the rover remote control and you want to see how well you can navigate using that remote control. So when you have some time, you're playing around, your mentor's tired and they need a break, go get that rover, get your remote control and see how well you can make it go around obstacles in your house.
okay? So that will be the third event. We'll have it posted by this afternoon. Hopefully we'll have event three and four. Event four has to do with the steering. Some of those things you guys were talking about, Samantha and Kaylin were talking about how that fine steering movement and it went straight and it wasn't supposed to. You have to steer your Rover to get it to a certain point. And so I'll have the directions hopefully posted for that this afternoon. Any questions on the competition? All righty. Um, I think that's all I have. Yesterday, I did post a video um, on, it's in the um, propulsion and I posted it to the stream. If you were trying to type on the propulsion test data sheet, you can't because it is a protected copy. You have to make a copy and download it into your Google Drive. And then when you mark that assignment as done, you can actually attach that document. There's a video posted again in the stream. If you're, if you're not sure how to do that, look at that. You do not have to submit the graphs. Um, the graphs you'll just use in your notebook and you'll answer a few questions on that. Um, so you guys have fun. Don't forget, I know when you're taking that data, you go, oh, this seems too much like school. And you're like, oh, this isn't what this is supposed to be. This is supposed to be fun. But the data you're collecting and all these tests, remember, they correspond with something we're going to ask you to do in the competition. So all those times we ask you to take that data, you're learning how well your rover operates and on what um, measures it operates best, which makes it go straighter, which makes it turn, how does it avoid obstacles. All of that helps you compete in the competition. So it's all these tests, while it looks like school, it's your way of understanding your particular rover and how well it operates. So you have to learn how well your rover operates. And you may find that your mentors operates a little bit different than yours. Okay. Um, one of the questions we had yesterday, a biggie. Um, let me see who can answer this. When you are doing the propulsion test and you press one or two, what did you find out? Anybody want to answer? One or two what? When you press the speed variable for one or two, what did you find out? It can't go. Can't go. It doesn't move. Does anybody know why it doesn't move? It's not enough power. Not enough power to overcome what? Anybody know that? The force that needs to turn the wheels and move the rover. Very good. I don't know who just answered that, but that was a great answer. So there's a force on that wheel, okay, and the ground, and it has to overcome that and, and all of the workings in the motor before it can move. And when it does, then it will eventually move. So some of you guys were calling in yesterday and you were like, it doesn't move. Are we doing this wrong? You were doing it absolutely right, just so you know. You guys are doing a phenomenal job. Don't forget we're here all day. Um, call in if you get stuck on anything. We want to get you through this so you can start practicing for the competition events. And don't worry if you're a little behind. Okay, I know some of you guys said, oh, we're going to get there. Remember, we had set aside Tuesday and Wednesday for makeup days and to practice. And those of you that said you can't compete until Friday, that actually gives you Thursday. So those of you that are farther behind, if, if you can come on Friday, now we can't have everybody come late on Friday. I know that would be ultimate for most of you because it gives you more time. Um, depending on how we can space out, we have to keep everybody separated. Obviously, we don't want to pack you in a room, but we have a goal to do that to keep you separated. So um, you should have three good days after today to still kind of catch up that we're not introducing anything new. What Dr. Marsh talked about today was the last of the coding. So you guys will get through this, hang in there. Um, we're so excited to see what you can do today. Um, uh, one thing that was kind yes. of strange was with, with the, um, the two speed didn't work on the forward, like two power didn't work on going forward, but when I was going backwards, two actually let it move. It did. The two pulled, made it like, so do you have an idea of why maybe that worked? Uh, maybe it takes less energy to move it backwards than it does move it forwards. 
it, it could be, yeah. Um, it could be in the mechanics because you have that front wheel and maybe pulling that front wheel is it takes less energy than pushing it. Yeah. Um, that might be, a, uh, there's a good science uh, experiment to try next. So there's all kinds of things you can do. I can't wait when all this is over and you guys get to keep your rovers, if you didn't know that. Um, and you can try all this cool stuff with them afterwards that um, you have all this time to do and, and then you can get in and code it um, in different ways. So we're excited to see where you guys go with this program. Any more questions or comments? No. All right, anything from Bill and Chris this morning? Nope. Are you guys having fun doing this? I mean, has it been exciting for you up to this point? Yep. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Good deal. Good deal. All right. Happy day five. Y'all have a great day. Bye. 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 Michelle. Hey, Joey. Oh, Michelle, um, I have a question. Okay. Uh, uh huh. Uh, I know in the beginning I told you about the essentials. Yes. Yeah. Um. Oh, uh, they. Uh, they don't work. Okay. So, um, it could be a wiring problem. Now, have you gotten into coding it? They won't work until uh -huh. you get into navigation. You've got to get yeah. into. Have you already started uh, module five? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, so the first thing we need to look at is probably the wiring. So do you have your rover right there? Um, no, ma'am. Okay. Uh, my sister has it, has it at whole house. Okay. So that's probably the first thing. Before we we want to check the rover and make sure it's wired because on cer on those little guys, sometimes the wires slip, sometimes they're not wired correctly and it won't work if it's not wired correctly. And then we have to look at the coding and make sure your coding's correct. Mm -hmm. Um so is she headed to your house or are you headed there today? Uh -huh. Okay, yeah. so when she gets there, y'all give us a call and we'll look at your rover and we'll have her share the screen. We'll look at your coding and we'll Michelle. figure it out. Yes. Oh, uh, yesterday, uh, we already looked at the coding. It was all correct. Okay, then it's probably something with the rover. And it could, <laughs> unfortunately, be a faulty sonar so or ultrasonic sensor. So what we can do is we'll try it. Did it work in her car and just not your rover? Um, we have only done one. one okay, right gotcha. So the so what you can do if we look at all the wiring, it's not cor it's correct, and the coding looks correct. We'll have you get her ultrasonic sensor and put on your car, your rover, and see if maybe it's a faulty sensor because sometimes that happens. Okay. Okay. So when she gets there, hop back on, and we'll get you figured out. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Joey.